Hey church, welcome to Psalm 99, 100 and Psalm 102. There are so many cool things in these psalms. I feel like a lot of it will, will re remind us of so many important truths about the Christian faith. Here are a couple things that just stand out to me and automatically lead me to great ways to pray. In Psalm 99, in verse 4, it describes God as the one who is mighty and also says he is just and right. And so a simple way of saying that is God is absolute in might and he is absolute in right. He is both of those things. Both of those actually terrify us a little bit and yet automatically make us want to come close to him. In 1 Peter 5, 7, would say that we can cast all of our cares on him because he cares for us. That's because he is absolute in might. He is, his shoulders are so big and strong, he can carry any weight we put on him. And yet at the same time, the fact that he is perfectly right actually would automatically inspire us to obey him. How foolish would we be if we admit that he is absolutely right and don't obey? In John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And so that right there shapes our healthy relationship with him. And then in verse 6, it uses the example of Moses and Aaron and Samuel in their relationship with him, pointing out that they call on him and he responds. How awesome is that, that a God who is absolute in might and right responds to our prayers? What on earth? Guys, this blows our minds. We should be erupting in praise, which would be fitting because we're in the Psalms. And then it goes on to talk in verse 8 about this God who both forgives and yet at the same time punishes. Isn't that interesting? He's a forgiving God, though you punish their misdeeds. That is a reality, church, that even though God is a forgiver of sins and will forgive us for all of our sins and purify us, like 1 John 1 says, there are examples, many in the Bible, but some would be like of Moses, who disobeyed, and the consequence for sin remained, although God forgave him. He was not allowed to enter the promised land after disobeying about striking the rock instead of speaking to it. The same thing with David in 2 Samuel. It talks about how he was punished for the sin of Bathsheba with his child dying, although the Lord forgave him for that and went on to use him for great things. And he was known as the man after God's own heart. And so here is a descriptor of a beautiful relationship with God in which we acknowledge that he is the God who is absolute in might and right and forgiving and yet will punish us when that is what we have coming. And so... Why don't you maybe just ask the Lord this question, Lord, when I think about all those things, I'm lost in praise and yet a little intimidated. So you could ask the Lord a simple question and just say, Lord, do I have a healthy relationship with you? And if you do, you will erupt in praise. I can see it coming. Then in Psalm 100, I can already tell you also where your prayer is going to tend to start if you have this healthy relationship with God. Because in verse 4, it talks about entering his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with or. His gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I always mix those up. But here's the thing. That reminds me of the, what we know as the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 that begins with, hallowed be your name, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. It begins with that, that attitude of praise and thanksgiving. Very similar to what Hebrews 13 talks about when it says, those of us who confess Jesus as our Lord and profess his name, should be continually offering to God a sacrifice of praise. And so an important thing to remember is that that is how we ought to approach God. And that's where our prayers should start. That means they won't, that our praise and thanksgiving towards God will not be based on circumstance. It will be based on who God is. And he is always worthy of praise and thanksgiving. And so you could ask God a question. God, do I sometimes forget that you are always worthy of my thanksgiving and praise. Confess and repent is necessary, and then just determine that your prayers will start there. Then when we have requests, they can come after that. And here's the beautiful thing. If we look in Psalm 102, here we have an example of a man who is destitute and his life is difficult. He is lamenting before the Lord. That's what it says under the heading of Psalm 102, just before verse 1. But then in verse 17, even though he is in a destitute place, he said he knows he is depending on God's promises and his character to believe that God will respond to his prayers. He says in verse 17, he will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. And so this guy is building that not on his just his experience, but on God's promises and his character. Reminds us of passages like Isaiah 30 that talk about how he will speak to us 
uh, and show us whether to turn to the left or to the right, well, our ears are going to hear behind us that voice. They will hear that. Jeremiah 33 says that God will speak to us and show us things. In John 14, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit will teach us. He will remind us. These are the promises that we have. We know that the Lord responds to our prayers, just like he responded in Psalm 99 to Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. What a wonderful God we serve. Why don't you take some of those things and celebrate them today with Jesus.